The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Jesus is invited to Martha's home for dinner and finds that Martha and her sister Mary have different understandings of their role that day. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. Be seated. Please consider these next few minutes the beginning of a conversation that we can continue during sermon talk. I'll ask a few questions along the way, and then we can talk about them later. So this is kind of a one-sided conversation at this point, but we'll pick up the other side after coffee time. I grew up instilled with the fear that life without rules was the quick road to destruction. That was clearly true with respect to the world. It was the era of the Cold War, a time in history that ended before some of you were born. I lived in the free world where the rules and laws protected me from the evil empire that was anchored by the Soviet Union. That's what the three legs of the nuclear arsenal were all about. That's what the rules about bomb shelters and duck and cover were all about. Duck and cover was a drill in elementary school, the goal of which was protect, to protect me from a nuclear bomb by having me kneel under a desk or beside a wall and covering my head. And I suppose that our, was our version of active shooter drills that children have today. To preserve the freedom of the way of our way of life, rules and boundaries were needed, even the power to destroy the whole world. Too much freedom leads to the loss of freedom, and our symbol was the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe. Today, in the absence of a literal Cold War, which affected all of us equally, we seem to have taken this need for rules more individually. For many, rather than the three legs of the nuclear arsenal, a variety of litmus tests have been adopted to try to prevent chaos. Tests around gun ownership, abortion, validity of elections, incarceration, gender issues, immigration, name it. Rules are needed to construct order and prevent chaos. Fear of life without rules was also true in the local community, church, and personal life. As I learned later, the beginning of our present denomination, the Mennonite Brethren, had much to do with the desire to bring back into focus a more disciplined way of life. There was too much of the world in the Mennonite communities in the Ukraine in the 1850s and 60s. There was too much freedom, not enough accountability. It was more than just dancing and drinking in the villages. And some of those who participated in the breakaway groups actually became too free, too joyous, and had to be brought back into line. Too much freedom leads to chaos and eventually a dissolute life, which is a quick way to the broad road, the broad road which leads to destruction. So I don't mean for any of these preceding comments to sound tongue-in-cheek. I grew up at a time when both at the national and international level of political structures and at the local congregational personal level, rules and laws and structures were there to protect me, and to guide me, to keep me from suffering the consequences of unregulated freedom. Essentially, there was one answer. Obey and stay within the rules as handed down. 
A good friend, Richard Block, once told me that there was no danger. In fact, there was freedom in riding a motorcycle if you just stayed upright on two wheels. Obedience to the rule protects the rider. Not in all cases, unfortunately. For much of my early life, I approached the Bible in the same manner. I was taught to read the Bible as a set of rules, a kind of expanded Ten Commandments. That's exaggerating a bit, but maybe not too much. On Saturday night, as we're getting ready for Sunday, it was children obey your parents. On Sunday morning, it was, it is not good to forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Every two weeks, it was a trip to the barber because it's an abomination for a man to have long hair. Not every rule had a biblical citation, even if they sounded like they should. When it was time to go to work, it was God helps those who help themselves. I don't think that's in scripture. When I wanted too much help, it was pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. A rather impossible task if you think about it. So did you grow up with those kind of rules? <clears throat> Yet in our readings for today, both the gospel reading and the epistle reading, neither Jesus nor Paul gives a very easy answer as to what it means to live as a follower of Jesus. And I don't mean that they ask us to do particularly difficult things. They just aren't very clear, not very precise about how and when we are to do the things they ask us to do. For example, in the story of Mary and Martha from Luke 10, it's actually not a very complicated story. It's a story of a household dispute between sisters. Martha is the hospitable one. She welcomed Jesus into her house, and the responsibilities of the house and the occasion fell upon her. Mary had chosen to do nothing, so to speak. According to the story, Mary didn't welcome Jesus. She didn't help Martha with the many tasks, which could have included sending out invitations, cleaning the house, preparing and serving the food, hosting the gathering. It isn't recorded that Martha had help from servants, and without the help of Mary, the routine things that had to be done to carry out this event fell upon her. And so she spoke up. She spoke directly to Jesus. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to get on with the work by myself? Tell her to, tell her to come give me a hand. She wasn't necessarily whining. The text doesn't actually reflect that. She simply came to Jesus and spoke to him. But Jesus didn't honor her request. Instead, he affirmed Mary, who chose to sit at his feet and listen. She's chosen the better part, to be a disciple who listens and hears. So when we want to get out of housework, we use Bible study for an excuse when we don't want to do something, we claim the role of Mary for ourselves, choosing what we think is best. When taking a public stand is too hard, we simply offer thoughts and prayers. And how does this fit into the larger context of Luke? What about hearing and doing and building on the rock, the seed in the good soil that represents those who hear and hold fast and yield a harvest no, it doesn't work to simply use Bible study to get out of work. To be a follower of Jesus, to fulfill the two great commands, we must act, particularly with respect to our neighbor. Unless you're Mary, Mary who chose the better part, to sit and listen at the feet of Jesus. I can understand each on its own, but when you put the two together, it requires more consideration. We must do both, listen and act, love God and neighbor, not giving undue, undue importance to one over the other. It's not that Martha doesn't have a legitimate concern to be a good host, serving Jesus and others. It's not the that the lawyer in the Good Samaritan story, just preceding this Mary Martha story, shouldn't study the law, the better to live according to it and eventually inherit eternal life. It's to be done in proper proportion at the right time. 
And to a sometimes uncomfortable degree, that proportion and timing is left to us to figure out. So what about just listing the things we can do and the things we can't do? That would make it easy, wouldn't it? Well, some have read this passage that Al read from Galatians in just that manner. Here, Paul has laid out some of the yeas and some of the nays. Follow these yeas and avoid these nays, and you'll be all right. At the time of the writing of this letter, there was actually some division within the churches in Galatia. Some suggest that there were a number of people present who'd actually been the victim of Saul's persecution and now wanted to hold him, the converted Paul, accountable to the law. Others suggest that many of the people were Jewish proselytes familiar with the law and the prophets who had difficulty giving that up, having gone through that rather lengthy process to adopt it. The point is that there were differing opinions on the value and place of the law in the life of the church and in the lives of believers. So are these lists just to obey without question? After a rather direct section in chapters four and five, making the case for freedom from the law, Paul begins section, this section at chapter five, verse 13, with warnings about taking the course of freedom too far. Freedom from the law doesn't do away with the obligations to moral conduct. But now moral conduct is the result of the operation of the free spirit of God, not the mandates of the law. Paul makes the case that Christian freedom is the key to life. It appears that the threat to the Galatians wasn't unrestrained license, but the opposite, severe, divisive, and slavish adherence to the law. The Galatian tendency was to accept the external marks Things like circumcision and observance of the sacred calendar without the accompanying ethical significance of such things. To make his point, Paul warns them that the consequences of fighting about interpretation and adherence to the law is mutual destruction. I forget just the words that Al used on that, but mutual destruction, that's pretty tough language. There is an option to this kind of slavery to the law, to the inevitable division which results from it, because the law can't be fully and uniformly observed by all. The alternative is freedom in the spirit. According to New Testament scholar Frederick Bruce, the call to freedom then is a call to oneness in Christ and to loving service within the believing community. That's as if Paul is saying, if you must live in slavery, here is a form of slavery in which you may safely indulge, the slavery of practical love for one another. In fact, love for one another fulfills both the spirit and intent of the law. Jesus combined Deuteronomy 6 with Leviticus 19 when he and the lawyer talked about what must one must do to inherit eternal life. Love God and love neighbor. In Romans 13, Paul says that we are to owe no one anything but love. According to Rudolf Bultmann, Paul is in complete accord with Jesus. The real demand of the law is love, in which all the other commandments are summed up. In spite of how we might read the two lists that Paul leaves us in the fifth chapter of Galatians, the warning is clearly about communal strife not simply personal failings. The direction of the spirit guides us to love of neighbor, not an individual pure life according to the rules. That's the Saul Paul story. Consider that when Saul was most nearly following the law with which he was raised, he was persecuting and killing Christians. It's life under the direction of the spirit that leads to love of neighbor and harmony within the community. To walk by the spirit is to have the power to resist the flesh. That is all those things aside from God in which one places final trust. 
point of chapter 5, 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. The point is that the believer isn't a helpless battleground between flesh and spirit. This is really just the old struggle between the already and the not yet. Jesus' resurrection has set us free, but we still live on earth. And so we're subject to the struggle that that entails. But it's not a struggle without resolution or end. And Paul gives us two lists then that explain the struggle. In the context of Paul's day, these kind of lists often reflected a call to moderation, a warning about excess. Paul certainly doesn't subscribe to the idea that good deeds admit one to the kingdom. That's just another version of the law. But he's adamant that evil deeds of the type mentioned in the list can keep one out. They are sins against the common life of the group. At the heart of the first list are things such as, and this is using older language than Al used, enmity, quarrelsomeness, jealousy, outbursts of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, party spirit, and envy. These things run directly counter to the admonition to serve one another in love. These are sins against the common life. And Paul follows that first list with a list of the harvest of the Spirit. Of course, we're reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew that trees are identified by the kind of fruit they produce. Paul offers a list of the nine graces, characteristic of the lifestyle of those in whom the Spirit is alive and active, beginning with the great three, love, joy, and peace. Love, of course, the greatest, Neighborly love as the fulfillment of the law, a response to the love of God as made known to us in Christ. Joy and reconciliation with God and peace, the spiritual twin to joy. To have peace, to have peace with God is to be reconciled to God. Those who are reconciled rejoice in the shalom, the wholeness. Peace is the mark of a child of God at home, in the congregation, in the world. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Then Paul completes the list with a series of qualities that address the life of the churches in Galatia. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The entire list is groups of three, easy to memorize in that form. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Insofar as these are present in our life, they are signs. They are evidence that we walk in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what brings harmony and unity to the body not rules. It's hard for me to think of these two lists in the context of the congregation because they've been so thoroughly drilled into me as applicable to the individual. It's hard for me to realize that they are not personal characteristics, individually achievable. That's not the context in which they're given. The context is serve and love one another. The context is, but if you go on fighting one another, all you can expect is mutual destruction. We're all free in some sense, and we're all enslaved in some other sense. The task today is to identify the ways in which we are free to love one another, and to identify the ways in which we are enslaved to those things not of God, those things that prevent us from loving one another. Neither Jesus nor Paul gives us an easy one, two, three answer. To be a follower of Jesus means to act, to both act in favor of one's neighbor and to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. The Samaritan was right to act in favor of the man along the road. The issue is to love the right way in the given situation. Obeying a list 
avoiding things on the list is not evidence of love of one's fellow human being. To love those around you, particularly those with whom you have differences, isn't a one, two, three from any list. The mystery of how to do this is resolved when we love and serve one another as God in Christ has loved and served each one of us. That's best done when our lives exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Amen.